Hey kids, welcome back. It's Kurt Thompson with Storytime Music 101. And um, get all cuddly and snuggled up. This is going to be a long one. And um, uh, the next guy here that we're going to be going over is Handel, Frederick Handel. And a um, very interesting guy. So uh, buckle up. Um, take your melatonin. Get your nice cup of hot cocoa. Dim the lights. Here we go on Handel. If anyone had known that Handel was going to grow up to become such a great composer, maybe we would know more about his early life. But nobody was paying much attention at the time. George Frederick Handel was born in 1685 in the little town of Hall in Saxon, Germany. If you go to Hall today, you'll see a house with a sign that says, Handel's birthplace. He was born in the house next door. <laughs> Handel's grandfather, Valentin Handel, had moved to Hall about 1600 and become the town's official breadwear. His father, George, who was 62 when the boy was born, whoa, wait a minute. Wow. The dude was 62 and he had a new baby, a newborn, wow. Okay, uh, the boy's, when the boy was born, he was, uh, his father was a prominent barber and surgeon. That's a useful combination of trades, although customers had to be careful when they asked George to take a little off the top and sides. But at least if he cut you shaving, he knew how to stitch you back up again. He once removed part of a knife blade from a boy who had swallowed it a year and a half earlier. George just looped a string around it and pulled. The boy came to be known as Rudolph the Sword Swallower. Rondo's father had no interest in music, so he, so he thought his son shouldn't either. He wanted his son to become a lawyer and make something of himself. Handel's mother, Dorothea, was more tolerant, and the story goes that she smuggled a small, quiet keyboard instrument called the clavichord into the house so the boy could practice late at night in the attic while his father was asleep. The story sounds too good to be true. If you ask me, Handel probably made it up. One day... When he was about nine, Handel went with his father to the place, to the palace of the Duke, who wanted more curls and a little trim in the back. While Handel's father was busy snipping, the boy wandered into a chapel where there was an organ. Forgetting his manners, he started to play some of the music he'd been practicing in the attic. Fortunately, the Duke wasn't angry and made Handel's father promise to give the boys music lessons. He studied organ with a man named Zakal. Handel practiced late at night. Handel enrolled at the University of Hall at 17 to study his law. His father had died earlier that year, but he went ahead with law anyway, even though his heart wasn't in it. He preferred concertos to codicils any old day. Still, it was a thoughtful gesture for the old man. Pretty soon, however, Handel jumped at the chance to become an organist at the Hall Cathedral and left school. He had already fi filled in many times before for the regular organist, who often arrived too drunk to play. These guys back in... Um, in history were just amazingly uh, interesting. By 1703, Handel had left Hall for the big city of Hamburg, where he supported himself teaching private students and playing second violin in the Opera House Orchestra. I like that. Handel didn't enjoy playing second fiddle to anyone, but it was a living. He became friends with Johann Matheson, and the two traveled to Lübeck to meet the great Danish organist Dietrich books to food. He offered them each his job in return for Mary and his daughter. They said they'd think about it and they left town in a hurry. <laughs> Same thing that happened to Bach, right? Handel and Matheson also got into a big quarrel once, which they settled by having a, um, a rapier duel. It might have been serious when Handel was stabbed, but Matheson's sword was stopped by a button on Handel's coat. After that, they made up and were friends again, although Handel took to wearing coats with extra large buttons all over. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Handel's first two operas were produced in Hamburg. They were a moderate success. But Handel knew that if he wanted to make it in big-time opera, Italy was where it's at. He went there in 1706, although it's not all clear where he got the money to afford it. Handel spent most of 1707 in Rome, even though there wasn't any opera going on. The Pope had banned opera as being offensive and sacrilegious. 
Even though there was no opera, Handel had a good time anyway with lots of parties and musical events. He met many important Italian composers of the day, such as Arcangelo Corelli and the Scarlattis, Alessandro and his son Dom Domenico. Domenico. Handel and the younger Scarlatti had a little contest to see who was the better player. Scarlatti beat him at the harpsichord, but Handel cleaned up on organ, so it worked out to a tie. Handel played tourist for a while and went off to Venice. In 1709, his opera, Agrippina, was performed there. The audience loved it so much they began shouting, Viva il caro Sasson, which means long live the beloved Saxon. Handel was in and he knew it. All told, Handel spent about three years in Italy. In addition to the operas, he wrote about 100 cantatas and some church music and had a good time. In 1710, Handel acquired a job as Kapellmeister to the page turn. Whew, this is a long one. And I might have to like abbreviate a little bit of this. Who was the Elector of Hanover? He got the job because he knew someone who knew someone. He had only been there a few months when he asked for some time off to go to London. On his way, he passed through a hall and said hi to his mom, who told him to go pack clean socks and ride home when he got the chance. Handel was an even bigger hit in England than he'd been in Italy. Londoners accepted him with great enthusiasm. They hadn't had any composer to get really excited about since the death of Purcell back in 1695, so Handel came along at just the right time. He composed the opera... Ronaldo for the first London visit, and the crowds loved it. Whole chunks of Ronaldo are made up of music Handel took from his earlier opera, Agrippina, and some of the oratorios, but the, autor but the audience didn't know that. And Handel wasn't about to tell them. <laughs> um, here is in the footnote, Handel often borrowed from his own music. Later he got a little carried away and started stealing from other composers too. Didn't know that. Hmm. Okay, so continuing on. One of the highlights of the Rinaldo is his use of recorders to represent singing birds. And in case that didn't get the point across, at every performance there were a few live sparrows released on stage. This sort of thing is alright as long as it doesn't get out of hand. Whoa. One of his later operas included live bears. Eventually, Handel realized that he had better keep his promise to return to his job in Hanover, although he didn't want to. Want to. Compared to London, life at the court of Hanover was dull. Within a year, he had convinced the elector to let him visit London again, promising to return in a reasonable time. His first London visit had lasted seven months. The next one lasted 50 years. <laughs> so, um, he actually didn't quite keep his word on it, did he, folks? Handel composed a couple of operas for the 1712 season and also a birthday ode for Queen Anne his first setting of English words. He hadn't quite got the hang of the language, but was keen to work at it. In 1713, Owen McSweeney, manager of the Haymarket Theatre, skipped town with all the money from Handel's opera Teso, Teseo. It put a strain on their relationship. In 1714, Queen Anne died, and Handel's boss, the Elector of Hanover, surprise, surprise, became King George I, King George I of England. He couldn't speak a word of English, but that didn't seem to bother anybody, least of all George. He never knew what anyone was talking about, that that seemed to be a requirement of the job. A lot of people seemed to think that George was angry at Handel for having run off on him, and the story goes that Handel composed the orchestral suite known as the Water Music to get back on George's good side. George wasn't angry at all. One of the first things he did when he arrived was to give Handel a raise. The king also went to a performance of Handel's opera, Ronaldo. He was, he was supposed to be in disguise, but he brought along his favorite mistress and they chatted in German through the whole performance so everybody knew who it was. There is no doubt that George enjoyed the water music which Handel composed for a special royal outing on the Thames. The king and his friend, friends floated down the river eating and drinking while Handel and fifty musicians floated beside them on another barge playing dance music. The king liked the music so much that he had it played three times. It was a huge success, although the players got a little wet. Handel moved to Middlesex for a while as a house guest of James Bridges, the Duke of Chandos. Chandos had been paying, had been, Chandos had been paymaster to Queen Anne's army during the War of the Spanish Succession, and somehow 
came out of it a whole lot richer than he went in. He spent a fortune building a big house called Cannons, which had plenty of guest rooms. Huh. Hanva composed the Eleven Church anthems, now known as Chandos anthems, while he was there. One story tells us that during a thunderstorm, Handel took refuge in a village blacksmith's shop and then composed a set of variations on a tune he heard the harmonious blacksmith whistling. You can believe it if you'd like. In 1719, a group of noblemen set up the Royal Academy of Music and asked Handel to be music director. They wanted to produce great operas, so Handel went off to Europe to hire singers. Handel dropped into Hall to see his mother. Hearing he was in town, Bach walked 20 miles from Leipzig to meet him. But by the time Bach arrived, Handel had just left. Sorry, Bach. Opera in the 18th century was quite different from nowadays. Back then, the audience didn't even pretend to listen to be listening to the music. They went to socialize, play cards, eat and flirt with whomever caught their fancy. The singers didn't help matters. They would bring their favorite arias with them and insert them into the action, even if the aria was from a different opera. Now, what? That is bizarre. You can imagine um, Madame Butterfly and um, someone singing something from Carmen. I mean, that's just an example. Of course, they weren't written probably in where they could do that. But um, that would be that's just kind of bizarre, actually. I didn't know that. Okay, continuing. The leading female role, called a prima donna, was usually a soprano. Now, we've all heard prima donna. The leading male role was called a was usually a castrato from Italy, where they specialized in that sort of operation to have sharper knives. He is called a primo umo. Tenors were rarely used and never for important parts. The music consisted mostly of arias, about thirty of them, in the da capo form with a built in repeat. It was like having a guaranteed encore. The Royal Academy opened in seventeen twenty and Handel set to work composing one opera for, after another. Audiences created a bit of rivalry between Handel and another composer, Bonaccini, but it was nothing compared to the rivalry over the two main sopranos, Cuzzoni and Faustini. Handel had brought uh, Cuzzoni from Italy. She was a bit moody, but had a lovely voice. Horace Walpole described her as a short and squat. Once, when she disagreed with the way Handel wanted her to sing an aria, she, he held her. He held her out the window until she saw things his way. Let me repeat that. Okay, so we, this singer that he had in the opera, this vocalist, uh, I guess was a prima donna, and um, Handel wanted her to sing this aria in a certain way. She refused, and he, he must have picked her up and held her by her legs outside the window and was going to drop her until she changed her mind. Very interesting. Very weird. Handel was always having trouble with singers. When a tenor named Gordon threatened to jump on Handel's harpsichord, the composer said, Tell me when, and I will advertise. More people will come to see you jump than to hear you sing. And that shut him up. In order to draw larger crowds, the Academy imported another soprano named Faustina. Full rivalry with Cuzzoni went to absurd lengths. For one opera, Handel had to compose two arias, one for each of them, with an equal number of notes so that neither singer would feel cheated. The rivalry came to a head and it came to a head in seventeen twenty seven during the performance of Bonaccini's opera Ast Astianato. Different factions of the audience hissed and cheered for their favorite of the two singers. The audience audience got so heated that a fight broke out, followed by one on stage with the two sopranos going at each other tooth and nail. Some people take their entertainment very seriously. That same year George the First died from eating too many melons and was succeeded by his son George the Second. George II did no better. When he died, he was sitting on the toilet. These people. Okay, for his coronation, Handel composed the anthem, Zadok the Priest, which has been sung at every coronation ever since, but George got it first. In 1729, Handel made another trip to Italy to find um, good singers and came back with a soprano named Anna Maria Strada del Po. She remained loyal to him even when business was bad and all his singers other singers had deserted him for a rival opera company, the Opera of Nobility. There has been some speculation that Handel and Strato might have been having an affair, but I find no evidence to support this theory. In fact, not much is known about Handel's love life. He never married, although he did seem to have an eye for the ladies. There was one he toured Europe with as a young man, but I forgot her name. Historian Stanley Sadie 
puts it this way, a composer who could depict women in his music as vividly as Handel does is unlike to, to have been entirely ignorant of them in real life. Well, that's tactful. Whew. At some point in any discussion of Handel, his oratorial messiah is bound to come up. Oratorio was a useful escape for Handel from the problems associated with opera. In many ways, the music is the same, but without all the trouble of scenery and costumes and movements. On the whole, oratorio is a lot cheaper to produce than opera, which must have appealed to Handel's strong business sense. Huh. He was, um, Handel was also discouraged at having to set such awful librettos to music. The high point of Cersei, for, for instance, is the hero's love song to a tree. Weird. Okay. Handel's composed Messiah in just under three weeks. That's fast, but nowhere close to the record, not even for him. Handel composed his opera, Ferro Mondo, in nine days. Hmm. The libretto was compiled by Charles Jennings, who was a good librettist, but an but an extravagant fop. He had one servant whose job it was to pick up the oyster shells that Jennings discarded after him everywhere he went. On his way to Dublin, the, uh, on his way to the Dublin premiere of Messiah, Handel stopped off in Chester and assembled a bunch of singers to run through some of the new choruses. One of the bases, a printer named Jansen, made so many mistakes that Handel raged at him, I thought you told me you could read music at sight. And the singer replied, Yes, sir, and so I can, Jansen replied, but not at first sight. <laughs> now that's funny. That's funny. So you got to remember that. Next time someone says, Hey, I thought you could sight read. After you made a mistake, you can say, Yes, I can read music at sight. And sight read, just not at first sight read. Messiah was performed, Messiah was perform first performed in 1742. Better say that again, since it's pretty famous. Know that the Messiah was first performed in 1742, with 700 people packed into a theater designed to hold 600. In the advertisements, ladies were asked to wear skirts without hoops, and gentlemen were asked to leave their swords at home to make more room. It was a huge success and later caught on in London, where Handel used to close the season with a banging cheer. Handel, of course, was something of an expert on big, showy music. He once told the composer Gluck, What the English like is something they can beat time to, Something that hits them straight in the eardrum. Hmm. As anyone will tell you, the king was so moved by the first London performance of the Hallelujah Chorus that he stood up, thereby establishing a silly tradition that continues to this day. Personally, I think his foot had gone to sleep. You might call it the musical version of the seventh inning stretch. Speaking of big bangs, there was the theory behind Handel's Royal Fireworks music. The king had arranged for a big party with fireworks and music to celebrate with, but the special platform holding the fireworks caught fire, and everything went off too early. Then it rained. After the smoke had cleared, two people were dead and hundreds injured, but the music was nice. By the time, by this time, Handel was old and extremely fat and losing his eyesight. His sight was, only got worse after surgery by John Taylor, who deserves a place in his, history for having ruined the eyes of two of the two greatest composers of that period, Bach and Handel, and also of historian Edward um, Gibbon. Handel died on Good Friday in 1759 and was buried in Westminster Abbey. I've actually been there. I've seen Handel's uh, buried there. He's buried inside there, actually, among other poets. You'd think that this was, that with all the music he'd composed, someone would have had the sense to have some of it performed at his funeral. But the funeral music was composed by William Croft. Handel got his revenge later. No one listens to Croft nowadays. Okay. Long the tooth, folks. You've got to be dead asleep right now. Just completely asleep. So, we're going to sign off for right now. Hope you enjoyed Storytime with Kirk Thompson and Music 101. Time to go to sleep.